Chapter 6, verse 19 through 24. I know that's a lot of verses for me anyway. I'm working on uh, uh, the book of Acts as a commentary. Uh, I've gotten up to, I think, the sixth chapter. I'm at the sixth chapter. I mean, I've already done the verse by verse exposition, but I'm up to getting it put in a book format. So I'm up to the sixth chapter, and, you know, i got a ways to go. I think there's 28 chapters. So I told you it would be about six months to do that one, so I'm doing Job in the meantime. So it won't be too bad. It won't be too big. But I'm get, trying to get all these things put into a book format as much as I possibly can and as much as I can fo- possibly afford to do it. And then put the copies out free of charge. Keep a few for myself and maybe one for the library or whatever. The former pastor would have liked to have done the same thing, but the technology was not available at the time. So I'm hoping to do as best I can for the edification of the saints. Not for money. There's no money involved other than expenses to get it done. But anyway, and the time. It takes a lot of time, a lot of edits. But anyway... Uh, we're going to finish the book of Ephesians, and uh, this is the conclusion of this study. And you can go back as you'll study your notes down the road and see things that um, you can compare to other books of the Bible and other studies, especially those other writings of the Apostle Paul, especially when he was in imprisonment for those two years, and see some comparisons. And... Uh, See some of the, the lessons that were taught in this series. But I entitled this last lesson, Let's Finish the Mission. And it's not just spreading the gospel to the lost. There's a lot more to the mission that Christ kept left to the church. We're not only to be sharing the gospel, uh, but we are also to be teaching Baptizing, that is, confirming people in the faith. And uh, we are to uh, be edifying the body of Christ. Uh, That is also a part of the gospel. It's not just getting people saved, uh, but helping saved people grow up in the things of Christ. So let's finish the mission. Let's pray. Father, we ask as we go into the Word this morning that you'll bless the truth Bless it to our edification. And as we continue to heal spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically, that you will be the one that's in the, in the process of helping us where we need help. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, intellectually. That you will help us socially for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we do that in anticipation, Father, of the rapture of the church, the seven-year tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, and the millennial kingdom to follow of Christ. So help us to always remember that it's not over ever for us as Christians, whether it's in this life or the life to come. But thank you now for the grace that you give us, the understanding that you give us, and for the good Christian friendships that we have. Thank you now for this day of grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Paul said in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against a lot of things. Not against flesh and blood, but against a lot of things. And so we're to put on the whole armor of God so that we might with that armor be able to withstand in the evil day. And you never know when that's coming. But stand in the evil day with that day, not just a single day, but a period of your life. It could be 50 years. It could be 20 years. It could be five years. It could be five months. But that the evil day and having done all that you did, you could do, you did stand the best you could. You were trying to be faithful and you were overcoming 
your own failures by 1 John 1, 9 and getting into the Word. You had your loins girt about with the truth close to you. You had on the breastplate of righteousness that protects you both from your back and to your front. The path and the direction that you're taking, you have direction from all sides. Your feet shod for you to be prepared in the gospel. Not just you sharing the gospel, but primarily this is you having faith in your salvation and having your feet shod means that you had a firm grasp of your salvation. You learned the doctrines and the teachings of who Christ is and you applied it by faith and how God loves you and cares for you. You had your cleats on, as it were, and you held your ground. You learned to be a, a, a defender of the faith. It brought you peace. Above all, then taking the shield of faith, which is able to absorb or quench the two and a half by four foot oblong shield, the Thurios shield, to defend the fiery darts of those who attack your faith. Satan being the primary, but people will attack your beliefs. Your culture is firing darts at you. And Satan has the key to that armory that holds those fiery darts. And he's dispensing those fiery darts through political powers. He's dispensing those fiery darts through religious and cultural powers. But that faith that you have, that you're developing in the Word of God, and you're exercising it by sticking with it, is able to quench those fiery darts. They're useless. They have no power on you. And then you take it on and put on the helmet of salvation. You keep your mind protected from the evil influences. You keep your mind protected from letting wickedness set up shop in the harbor of your soul. And you stay in tune to the things of God. And then the last piece that you picked up is your only offensive weapon, and it is the Word of God. Not to use it as a, as a threat, but it's the sword of the Spirit. This was the little short sword. It was sharp on both sides. And Hebrews 4.12 says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing into the dividing asunder of soul and spirit in the joints of the marrow. And it is the discerner of the faults and intents of the heart. Your best offense in trying to share Christ is just sharing the Word, not opinion. And then the Word itself will do the work. That's what the Spirit of God uses is the Word. It's good for you. It's, it's good for the other person. It's your only offensive weapon. Everything else is a defensive weapon or defensive armor. They're all armor. The sword is the only weapon, and it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then the last thing you put the icing on that cake is with prayer. Prayer always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. <clears throat> Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. When it comes to the believer's concerns, the Lord is listening. He knows our hearts and fears. And Paul reminds us that praying is to be a constant state of mind for the believer who is living the normal Christian life. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. That war and the good warfare always enlist the wisdom of God along the way. Paul also reminds us that we must keep praying for our fellow soldiers in the Lord too, who stand for the Word of God, not just preachers, but all Christians. Not just the pastor and teachers, but also for any believer who stands for the gospel and the doctrines that the Bible uh, holds forth. You see, it's one thing for there to be good news for the unsaved that they can get saved, but what if there's no good news for the saved that they can be preserved and they can learn and that they can grow and that they can come, under, come to understand God even more and better? He wants us to be Preserved, not just saved, but preserved, not that we would lose our salvation, but that we would lose our hope and go back to the world. Though we'd go to heaven in the end, 
God doesn't want us. He wants to live us to live a victorious life. But also, Paul also adds to pray for the needs of all saints, for all believers, in other words. So chapter 6, verse 19, we pick up where he says, and it also says, pray for me. Yeah. Pray for me. You pray for yourself, verse 18, and then for others. And then Paul says, in particular, pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I, that because of the gospel, I am an ambassador in bonds. That in this I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You see, if we are hesitant to pray, perhaps we are hesitant to believe that the Lord is with us in the battle. Remember that. Perhaps we are hesitant to trust in the battle plan of the Lord, and we get in the flesh and try to fight the warfare that we are finding ourselves in through the energy of the flesh, through our own ingenuity, our own schemes. I will tell you that that is a war that we cannot win in the flesh, and we cannot win that unseen demonic war just through our human ingenuity, because Satan has had thousands of years to acquire what human ingenuity and human schemes look like. That's why he always seems to be a step ahead, because you're not trying anything new that somebody else didn't try a hundred or a thousand years ago. We cannot win the war against sin, and we cannot win the war against Satan just by the will of our flesh or our human intellect alone. Paul is saying we need the word and the wisdom of God. It is real and when applied, it is effective. Paul is asking for prayers from the believers for his openness to receive of the Lord the utterance. Paul says for me that utterance may be given to me. The word here is logos. Logos. And that is that the Lord will put into my thoughts and then into my mouth the words that I may be able to with confidence speak with boldness. Parisa is the word there for boldness. P-A-R-R-E-S-I-A. And it means to speak with plainness and frankness. To speak with uninhibited Openness of speech, where you're not always trying to figure out how to conjure up how to say something. It just spills out. You've been preparing mentally and spiritually. You are in a right spiritual frame of mind by being under the filling of the Holy Spirit. And when it is time to speak, God will help you have those things be recalled to your memory center and then executed through your mouth and your conversation. That's Frank Gablin's commentary from Expositor's Bible Commentary, what he says about that, which I will say he's a good uh, apologist of the faith. So we often pray that God will give a speaker or ourselves when we have to stand and do a, a talk or we're going to witness to somebody at the hospital, or we're going to do something like that, we pray for God to give us freedom of thought and freedom of speech. Well, that is a normal prayer request that is taken from this passage, that God would give you freedom of thought and freedom of speech. That's one of the things I prayed for for my pastor, Richard Frampton, for 27 years, and I'd sit down before he would speak. And I would pray that God would give him freedom of thought and liberty of speech or freedom of speech that he would be able to bring to his mind. God would have an access to his mind from his edification and his vocabulary and his being filled by the spirit that God would give to him something that would help me that day. I was here because I needed help. This is not a celebration station. This is a recovery center. 
Too often the church has looked at a celebration station rather than a recovery center. And this is for helping not just those who have got to go back out on the lines because often military personnel, though wounded, have to go back out on the front lines again and again and again. They're only, they're not getting put out there because they're ineffective. They're a doofus. They're causing trouble for everybody. They're getting put out there because they are the best that they've got to put out. And that's so often why so many soldiers, Marines, airmen, naval, were put back in duty again and again and again because they were proficient, they were trained, and they were confident, and they were good at their skill set. And the mess-ups, I won't use bad language, the mess-ups, they were always kept in the rear, doing some little menial task, because they couldn't be trusted to carry out the mission up front. And often the ones up front had purple hearts and they were still going back to the front. Or at least they had them in the paperwork. And sometimes in Christianity, God has to keep letting that same group of believers get beat up, get beat up, get beat up. But you can take it. You're big boys, you're big girls, you can handle it. Though you still have your own life too. But you've given your life to Christ. You know He gave His for you, but you're giving your life to Christ. You make no excuses for it. And so when it's time for you to speak up, you speak up. You say what needs to be said in a nice way. 1 Peter 3.15 says that we are to give an answer to every man of the reason that is hope that is in us. We've demonstrated that. But we're supposed to do it in a spirit of meekness as well. So Paul was a prisoner awaiting his trial, shackled to a Roman soldier in uh, a house somewhere near the courts, and he was awaiting his opportunity to speak before Nero and others. He was financially supported by the churches, so he could have that house under house arrest. That way the Roman government didn't have to pay to put him up. All they had to do was pay to have a soldier strapped to him. So they didn't have to pay to feed him. They didn't have to pay to take care of him. Uh, the church took care of him for the two years that he was in prison. And he could write letters and people could come and go. He could have visitors. He eventually was released uh, from that. But they said, we're going to keep an eye on you. Eventually they got him back and that was the end of it. But he knew that. But Paul wanted more than anything to speak freely as an ambassador for Christ without the encumberment of unnecessary thoughts or unnecessary words. Sometimes it makes no difference how well we are studied up and are mentally and prayerfully prepared. It seems that sometimes the words are hard to recall when we are under pressure and under physical duress. Or someone is just trying to be cute and trip us up. We have to take a breath and think about how we're going to respond to them and how we're going to honor Christ in what we say or do. And sometimes it's just best to say nothing. There's a proverb in the scripture that says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he think himself to be wise. Answer not a fool according to his folly, Lest he thinks he's wise. He's self-conceited. You can't help some people. My experience is that if you give your adversaries an inch of compromise when it comes to the things of God, they will take a mile. They'll drive a wedge in a mile wide and deep into your reasons as they try to tear your witness for the word of God apart. Don't let them do that. Be very frank, be very blunt, and just stick to the script. Stick to the script. A lot of art is being taught in the way, or there is an art uh, in the way. The art of the deal was Trump's book or whatever, the art of the deal or something like that. And there are Christian colleges that try to teach their students that when they go out as pastors or whatever, or defenders of the faith, how to couch what they say in such a way as to not to offend their audience. I say the best thing you can do is offend your audience. 
but but not do it on purpose. Just preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, buried, and raised. Teach what He taught. Teach what He gave His apostles. Teach what the Word of God says. And people will either concede that God is right, or they will show their colors. But it's their choice. Do not try to make the other person's choice for them. Do not try to convince them that you do them something very simple. You'll be saved. You need to see yourself as a sinner before you can ever get saved. Too many people supposedly are getting saved and have been for the last 50 years who never had in the gospel witness that was given to them the reason why they need to be saved. You're lost, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. If you do not receive Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you will die and you will spend a miserable eternity in hell. That's love. Being sentimental and telling people lies is not love. It's hypocrisy and it's deceit. Somebody's just doing that to save their own ego. I'm going to tell you one thing. When it comes to sharing the gospel, you might as well put your ego in the trash can. Dump it. Because it will get in the way every time. It will cause you to not want to knock on that door to speak to that person or to bring up Jesus in your conversation. Invite them to church, but don't bring up Jesus in the conversation. Bring Him up. Give the Holy Ghost something to work with with that person. It would be amazing. And I think you know that. But speak the gospel and the word of God. Add nothing to it. Don't take anything away from it. And the power of the Holy Spirit will put a muzzle on naysayers. If the word of God can cause the devil to flee, it certainly can shut up the trap of an unsaved, deceitful person. That person most likely is just getting in their own way anyway. You want to save them? You want to love them. You don't like them a bit, but you want to show them love. And that's how you can do it. If God allows that person to turn on you, so be it. But let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the past for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil, says Proverbs 4, 25, 26, and 27. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give, give careful thought to the path for your feet. Be steadfast in your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. And keep your foot from evil. And always remember, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Romans 14.8 You don't go alone. Paul realized he was an ambassador in bonds for a reason. He was in chains. Yes, he was in jail. Yes. But there was a reason for that. He says, for this reason, that I may speak boldly. As I ought to speak, I've already been seen as an outcast. I might as well do a good job of being an outcast. I've already been labeled as an oddball. I might as well be a perfectly good oddball. The world will always try to you to make you fit into its own shape. A square peg is what we are. We're squares. We don't fit. We don't go along with the go with the flow all the time. But the world is like a bunch of little round holes and they'll try to use social media. They'll try to use the culture. They'll try to use their self-righteousness as a big hammer or a big mallet to drive you as a square into a round hole and rub the edges off of you in the process. Stick with the word of God and they'll, they'll just wear their hammer out. They'll wear their arms out. They may not ever believe, but they'll be worn out with you. They're exasperated with you. And now they'll just leave you alone, and then the devil will come after you then, I reckon. <laughs> Himself or some of his minions. 
But Paul says, I am ambassador that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You see, when your enemies are all around you, you can't miss the target. It's the perfect place to be. If you're in a room when everybody despises you, then you don't have to look hard to find someone to share the gospel with, do you? Or share the truth with. You've got an audience. So just start witnessing the gospel and speaking the word of the Lord. Because you've got witness. You can witness to everybody. You don't have to. You know, that's what some people say when they were in the enemy's camp and they say, well, the enemy's all around it. And the guy says, good, then I don't have to worry about where I'm shooting, do I? Everywhere I shoot, it's an enemy. <laughs> Everywhere I tell the gospel is a person who needs it. The, and that's and it's a very dark place. And so at least a little bit of a witness, at least a little bit of a light, a little flicker brings hope that they hadn't seen before. Just a little flicker. You've been in any of these caverns, Luray or Dixie or some of the others, and you go down in there or up here at Natural Bridge, and you go down in there, and they, all the lights are then turned off just for a few moments, and your eyeball socket, your eyes hurt. The guide is talking to you about the darkness and how you can't see anything and how you're trying to, you can't even you put your hand up, you can't even, you can feel the breeze, but you can't, even see your hand in front of your face, though it's there. That's the way people are with the gospel. They're in the darkness. And you can put the Word of God right up in front of their face, but they can't see it. But then you start turning the light on of the gospel and the truth, and they see something. They might not like what they see, and that's why they usually turn away from it, but they need to see the light. Not everyone's going to come to the light. But some will. You did. The mystery of the gospel that Paul speaks of here is that it was neither Jew or Gentile or some amalgamation of either, but it was to put the Jew and the Gentile back together. That's part of the dispensation mystery that Paul exposes in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. That Jew and Gentile are equal. There's no one superior. There's no superior race. When it comes to the gospel, there's no superior economic status when it comes to the gospel or educational status when it comes to the gospel. It's free for all who will receive it. And it became that Christ would then live in you through the Spirit of God. And God would start changing your heart and changing your life and changing your hope and giving you the, the confidence of a life that's better than this one on the other side. It was Christ and Him crucified, buried, raised, and dead. That's part of the mystery. And people accuse Paul of slandering the law on one side of the fence. The Jews did. And others accused him on the Gentile side of ruining pagan idol business. Paul was just trying to preach Christ to save souls. That's all. So verse 21 and 22, it says, after he says, I'm an ambassador in bonds, that this I may speak boldly as I ought to, that is the gospel and the truth, but that ye also may know my affairs and how, how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. The people were interested in what was going on with Paul in that prison in Rome. Whether they were in Ephesus, Colossae, Thessalonica, Corinth, wherever they were, they would be interested, even in Jerusalem, how Paul was doing way over there in in, in Rome. How he was doing. So Paul requested their prayerful support regarding his situation from a personal standpoint, that they may know my affairs, that is, the things concerning me. Remember, he was charged wrongfully, and he he appealed to Nero, and he got his wish. Remember the story of we telling us telling of his long boat ride through the Mediterranean and Cyprus, and all of that that happened with him in that trip. That was interesting. 
But he, he uses a fellow by the name of Tychicus here. He was a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord who took Paul's writings to the church. That's noted in Acts chapter 20 and verse 4. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Tychicus was used as a courier, as a messenger boy, as it were, a footman for Paul. He would take the message and he would, by boat, planes, trains, and automobiles, <laughs> donkeys, whatever, walking, whatever, boat, whatever, and he would take the message from Paul there at Rome and carry the letter back to the places he would send him. And the, Paul would give encouragement to those churches, uh, to Philippi, to Colossae. He would give encouragement to them. Uh, he says, He shall make known to you all things whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs, things concerning us, and that he might comfort you. Paracalais, or paracaleto, kaleo, that he would come alongside and give you comfort through the words that I gave him to give you, that it would encourage the church. Paul knew that they were pulling for him, uh, that he would, he would encourage the church. The church was in its infancy stage, it needed that support. It's like, you know, it's like a mother having a child, and then two months later, she's put into captivity, and the child is left with foreigners. And she didn't give the child up. She was incarcerated. And that's what happened with Paul. The church was like a child of his, and he was incarcerated. The other apostles were still out there, but he had started many churches, and he felt like, that he needed to keep an eye that they get their doctrine straight, their leadership was right. He is an apostle. He was over those things. We don't have apostles today. We have the Word of God in full written form. We have churches. You have a mind. You have a Bible. You can read it, what the format should be for an orderly local church. And Paul wanted to encourage them. He knew that there were wolves out there that wanted to destroy the church. He knew that there was mixed up teaching in the church and he wanted to get that corrected, but he was confined for two years in a prison or at least in a house that was rented out and paid for by the church, few of the churches. But this Tychicus, he would take from Paul the words and letters of to the, those churches and he also take words of encouragement to those people. And Paul knew that Tychicus would convey the heart of Paul. He could trust him. So this same man uh, was sent by Paul to Crete at one time. Titus was commissioned and put on Crete by the apostle Paul, who recognized his gift as a pastor. And Titus was put on the island of Crete, which is a like Dodge City or Las Vegas. Uh, that was the hangout place for gamblers, hangout place for criminal elements. Uh, hangout place for a lot of people, though there were a lot of business, honest business around in that, that place. But, uh, Titus was set to be a pastor of a church there. So one time Tychicus was sent there to relieve Titus so he could go visit Paul. And then, uh, I guess, uh, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 12. No, that was Titus 3, 12. And then once Tychicus was sent to Ephesus to relieve Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.12. So the same man who was a courier who carried the letters and words of encouragement uh, out from where Paul was in prison, out to these people, uh, he would go out and relieve Titus to help him at his church while Titus went to visit Paul. And, and he did the same thing for Timothy. So Timothy could leave this church in good hands and... It would not fall apart under Tychicus's watch. It would not fall apart under his watch. And it would not go into false doctrine or be driven by cultural desires of the, of the immature group in their church. So that was a great relief for Paul to have this fellow in Christ be such a faithful helper. Tychicus could be trusted to keep the faith and to feed the flock as an interim pastor of sorts, one who would fill in as needed, one who did not have selfish ambitions. 
who had the freedom to come and go as needed. This same faithful servant is the one who accompanied the runaway slave Onesimus, whom Paul sent back to Colossae, and as seen in Colossae in chapter 4, verses 7 through 9 in the book of Philemon. Colossians 4, 7 through 9 tells of that person, Tychicus, taking Onesimus, and Paul said, you take him back to Philemon and report that he is now a believer and treat him as a brother. And Philemon treat and Onesimus treat Philemon as a brother and respect him for his position in his business. So he was good for that too. He was what I would call a malleable man, not in his theology, but he was willing to do whatever it took to get the job done. He didn't need to take the lead. He was willing to be a faithful follower. And I will tell you, there are plenty of faithful followers who will have more stars in their crown than many pastors will. Because there are leaders who are not as good of followers of Christ as there are believers who are not, who are better followers of the leadership that Christ gives them in the Word. They are being followers of Christ by following a good pastor. Tychicus saw this. Paul saw it in him. So here is Paul chained to a Roman guard under house arrest awaiting trial for sedition against the Roman government charged for proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, proclaiming the gospel of grace which went against the Jewish culture and traditions, that Christ was Lord, not Caesar. And Paul was guilty, yes, but he put his faith in Christ as an ambassador for Christ. Paul saw himself primarily in bonds, but chained more to Christ than that of a Roman guard. You've heard it said that if you were charged in a court of law for being a witness and follower of Jesus Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? We've heard that one before. So I repeated it. It's worth repeating. The evidence against the Apostle Paul was overwhelming. Though on this two-year stint in prison, Paul would eventually be released, but for a short time. And I will add that the evidence against the unbelieving masses who rejected Paul's witness, it too was overwhelming. That the unbeliever has overwhelming evidence to convict them in Jesus Christ's court one day. At the great white throne judgment which will be too late. No negotiations after you're dead. So we close this book and this chapter, chapter 6, verses 23 and 24, where Paul says, Peace be to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with them all that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. May there be a settled state of mind, Paul says, among the beloved of God. That's what Irene or Irene, you heard the lady's name, Irene, that's what comes from the Greek word peace or Irene or Irene. And it means to have a settled state of heart and mind. That's God's produced that. He says, let there be a settled state of mind among the beloved of God, regardless of the warfare that Satan wages against you. May agape love with belief from the Father and the Lord Jesus be with you as well. Embrace God's unconditional love for you. Believe in it. And grace be with all those that unconditionally love our Lord Jesus Christ with sincerity. Grace be with all those. God's unconditional love. Uh, grace, His unmerited favor, may it be with all those that unconditionally love the Lord Jesus Christ with sincerity. That means in purity. That's what the word sincerity in the original means. That you love the Lord with purity. You have no ulterior reason other than Jesus Himself. You have no corrupt motives or disloyalties. 
And so as we close up this book, I'll add what our title was. Let's finish the mission. Paul says, let's keep going. Let's keep moving forward. Let's finish the mission that Christ set us out on and let's finish it well. Let's keep our armor on. Let's keep the Word of God sharp in our minds. Let's keep praying one for the other. Let's humble ourselves before the Lord in our marriages and as children with their parents and vice versa. I was holding in the, the ground, the high ground of, to spiritual maturity. Let's do all these things. Let's never be forgetful of all the grace blessings that we have bestowed upon us that were ordained before eternity passed. Thanking God for the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's continue to do this. And as you read through the book of Ephesians, sometime, somewhere, some way, somehow, or another, during the years and months to follow, months and month, years to follow, these lessons have, will, some of this stuff will come back to your mind. Perhaps your notes will be helpful at that time. Perhaps the website will be helpful at that time to go back and review if, if it's still up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for your blessings, for your kindness to us and the mercy that you show us. We thank you that you have done for us great and wonderful things and that we have not forgotten those things, that we have not forgotten you, that Jesus Christ is still our first love. We know that the book of Revelation teaches in chapter 2 of Revelation, that the church at Ephesus, Jesus said, I have one thing against thee, that they left their first love. They held their corporate status high among regard among the people. They kept their works high among the people. We know, Lord, but we know that they just lost their intimate walk with you. May we never let that happen with us. Thank you again for this day and for this day of grace. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.